songs. How's everybody doing today? Let me see some love in the chat, guys. Let me see the energy. Uh, listen, I'm a little bit under the weather. I've been trying to shake off uh, a flu here the last couple of days, and it's not letting me go. It's not letting me go. Uh, but I definitely wanted to make sure I was here for this one because, uh, you know, mm -hmm. Natasha is one of our great ones, and uh, I'm super pumped about this session. Uh, Natasha Valese comes to us with an amazing, amazing history on the luxury market. And who wants some luxury listing, guys? You guys want some luxury listings? Wants to crack into luxury? You guys want more of that? I bet we all do. I mean, that's such an amazing pillar of our business to grow. And we're going to dive deep into that. Uh, before I introduce Natasha, though, Always remember, guys, we have this in your calendar. GapMastermind.com is where it's at. Make sure you have it here every Monday at noon Eastern time. If you're in the West Coast, it's 9 a.m. Central, you do the math. But at the end of the day, you want to have these things in your calendar. Make sure you're always plugged in and growing with us. In addition to that, uh, we have our Bill Conference coming up. And that's something that I want to make sure you guys, if you don't have your ticket for build in July, I think it's the 8th of July where it begins. It's in San Antonio, Texas. You want to make sure you go to uh, buildevent23.com and grab your ticket. And if you have your ticket and haven't booked your hotel, guys, make sure you book your hotel because they're about sold out. Uh, they're going to be sold out any minute. And you want to stay in the host hotel. You want to stay there. We're going to have amazing masterminds on the side. We're going to have fun together. You, you want to be in the house. Um, so don't miss these opportunities to connect, to build community, to mastermind, and to take your business to the next level. And today, this is one such opportunity. We have Natasha, who started her career in 2006 and has been ever since building her luxury business, but not just saying, hey, I'm a luxury agent. No, uh, this lady is someone that has done it. She's had in her hand the six-figure commission checks from selling big luxury deals. She's certified by Rich Carlton. She's certified by the Luxury uh, Institute of Agents, the Guild Certification. And if you don't have the certified luxury and real estate specialist designation, that's a great place to start, guys. You're going to start getting that designation even without the luxury listing, the luxury business, and then get your guild once you reach those levels where you can get the training to go out and get the business. Um, but she, she wants to talk. She has a roadmap. She's one of our top partners. She joined us and grew a revenue share organization on fire and she's building culture. I've been blessed to go and teach to her team and see how she runs her operation. And uh, she's going to bring for you guys how to take your luxury business to the next level or even get it started if you haven't gotten it started yet. So Natasha, take it away. I'll be around, as I said, I'm a little bit sick, but so I'm gonna turn your uh, my camera off so you don't see me sneezing and cleaning my nose. But I'll be here and I'll jump in uh, to moderate as needed. But take it away, Natasha. Thank you so much, Carlos, and hope you feel better. Thank you guys so much for joining me today. Um, just to tell you a little bit about myself, I am in Houston, Texas, and I got into real estate 16 years ago. Uh, before you had to be 18 to get into real estate. Just kidding. Uh, I'm having a hard time turning 40 soon. Anyway. Uh, I got into real estate 16 years ago, and prior to real estate, I worked in uh, luxury apartment homes, and I worked right across the street from NASA, so I very quickly learned how to cater to not just astronauts, um, the Russian cosmonauts. It was really cool, so just learning how to provide that level of service um, to those people that were here that were pretty important people was a really cool job. So then I transitioned into real estate and uh, got into real estate in 2006. And we all know what happened in 2008, right? I got my first luxury listing. <laughs> um, don't let the market determine your future, okay? 
it's an excuse or it's motivation, you choose. I got my first luxury listing in 2008. It was a waterfront listing. And um, it was, I ended up bringing the buyer as well. Guess what? Listings bring you buyers. They bring, bring you buyer leads. So got into, uh, got into my first sale um, in Texas, or particularly where I'm at, we've got oil and gas. Okay. So we have a lot of um, big companies around us in oil and gas, and we have Waterfront as well, and we have NASA. So how cool is that? We have all of these opportunities around us. So um, I got that sale done, and I picked up two other buyers from that. Again, remember, it's 2008, right? One of those buyers I showed for about seven months. Okay, lots of showings. Probably the most I've done in my career was with that client. He still gets the award every year at my client events, uh, most show homes, and I hope nobody ever tops that. And uh, so patience, that's one thing you're going to need to have is patience. There's not a ton of inventory for luxury homes in my area. I'm not sure where it is where you're at, but there's not a ton of inventory. So you have to be patient. And um, so picked up two buyers, one of which um, I showed for seven months and got him under contract. And if you think it doesn't pay to be patient and not just have commission breath, um, you know, when we thought that, okay, we're at the point, we may have to go to a plan B, which was gonna be him and his family renting something. We found the perfect home. It came on the market, found the perfect home, and it had a bonus, which at that time in 2008, um, it was $10,000. So not only did I get the, the commission, the full commission, I also got a bonus. So you just never know. Um, but the most important thing is to provide a good experience for your client. Never did I ever want them to feel like I was taking too much time. Um, they were taking up too much of my time. They are the most important thing. And I made sure they felt that way. So my question to you all is, what is the difference between service and an experience? We all say, oh, I can service that client. I can service that client. Well, maybe your luxury clients don't want to be serviced. They want an experience. What does that experience look like? So we'll start with what's the difference. What do you guys think of when you think of service? Waiters, um, you know, people check you out at the counter, people that sell cell phones, they're providing a service, right? So how do we take that and how do we create an experience? Who has had a great experience somewhere? And you guys, please unmute yourselves, interact, because I want to hear this is, I'm here for you. So the more you ask me and the more that we interact, the more I think you're going to get out of it. So what is a service that you've encountered where you were like, oh yeah, that I was just being serviced versus that was an experience because guess what? You won't forget it. Eli. Nordstrom's. Nordstrom's. Nordstrom's, yep. Nordstrom's, I'm also thinking, um, have any of y'all stayed at the Ritz-Carlton? I say y'all, I'm from Texas, so. Uh, Ritz-Carlton, has many of y'all stayed at the Ritz-Carlton? Raise your hands if you've stayed at a Ritz-Carlton. Raise your hands if you've ever been on a Disney cruise. What was so different that made you pay double for a cruise when you could have gone on the carnival? The service, the experience with the service was amazing. Right. The everything. You felt like you were the only person on that ship, didn't you? Because of how well they catered to you, because they took such great care of you. Um, and Eli, you're absolutely right. McDonald's versus Chick-fil-A there's a big difference. So what I want you to start thinking about is when it comes to experience, how would your clients define it? Because we oftentimes are like, well, I think this, well, I think that. Well, what would your client say? How would they define an experience? And if you don't know, ask them. It can be previous clients. Hey, can you please tell me about the experience you had when we worked together? If you, if you don't know what to say, there you go. Ask for feedback. 
it's one of my favorite things to do with clients. After we close the transaction, after they've gotten everything and gotten settled, hey, I'm always learning to grow and be better. Can you please give me some feedback on your experience? And it's normally, it was so great. We really loved it. Appreciate that so much. Thank you. Can you please give me at least one negative um, that I can learn from or that I can grow or do better? And sometimes it's a long pause. I stay quiet until they give it to me. I don't say anything else until I get that. I want to know what I can do to improve because I'm determined to make sure that there is room for improvement and that I'm going to be better and do better. So how would your clients define it? If you don't know, ask them. Um, and please don't be transactional, okay? It, it comes long after. If you're not touching your clients long after the transaction, they're probably making friends with another realtor. How do you make them feel? It's personal. That's part of the experience is it's personal. So how do you get to know? It's personal and it's emotional. Um, there, you know, there's a lot that goes into it, but let's go back to, well, how do I know? I have a questionnaire that I give my clients at the beginning. Once we have just established that we're going to be working together, I have a questionnaire and it has all their likes. Um, they get to put down what's their favorite place to eat. Where do they like to shop? What's their favorite treats? I want to know all of those things and we'll get more, we'll get to that later on why and what I do with that information. Okay. So I want to anticipate their needs. Y'all, this is huge. This is probably the biggest thing that will separate you from others. Anticipate their needs before they do. If you can anticipate what that client needs or want, you're so far ahead. That comes from when you go to their house you're doing a walkthrough with them, right? Maybe you're going to a listing and they're showing you their house and you're like, oh, I'm going to need this to get stored away. I don't even know how to go about packing all that up. I had someone that had, you know, some really, really nice dishes that were her mother-in-law's and she went, she didn't even know. So guess what I did? I went and found someone that um, knows how to basically pack, best way to pack up dishes. And I had this particular mover come in and said, remember when you were concerned about those dishes, I got someone for you. Um, they, you know, they have expensive cars. How are they going to, you know, is that driveway going to fit? What can they do? You can look at things. You have to be observant and you have to be a good listener. If you can just pay attention to what they're talking about, what's important to them, they're going to tell you, I promise. If you just listen, they're going to tell you what's important to them. They're going to tell you what their, you know, maybe some of their um, concerns are, um, what's exciting to them, what's scary to them about this move. So just listen. Also, something that I've done that's always a big hit is I had boxes personalized. So I have moving boxes that have my logo on them and I drop some off. Basically, once they sign the listing agreement, it's like, okay, let me help you start packing. And um, I have personalized boxes that I drop off. So what else can you do? Um, you know, I do gifts personally. I do gifts throughout the transaction versus just a big closing gift at the end. Why is that important? Because it is tough, y'all. In case you forget, if you haven't bought or sold a house yourself in the past three, five years, you forget what a pain in the butt it is. And it's almost like, I feel like the closing gift at the end is anticipated. And again, I'm all about being there before they, they have that. So I give gifts throughout the transaction. It could be, you know, once we go under contract, once we've signed the listing agreement, once we've gotten past inspections, once we've gotten past appraisals, there are little milestones and big milestones throughout the transaction. That's your opportunity to give them something and surprise them with it. Going back to that questionnaire, right? I asked them, what are your favorite, where are your favorite places to shop? What are your favorite candies? What are your favorite treats? What's your favorite, you know, what's your favorite um, drinks? What's your favorite snacks? So that gives me an opportunity to give them um, what I call surprise and delights. So with the client, client questionnaire, what are some things that um, I ask? I ask about their pets. I ask about their children. I ask about their anniversary. If I know that they're married, I want to know those dates. 
Why? Because it's important to them. So it's going to be important to me as well. Now, why would you want to keep doing that? Um, guess what, guys? It's easier to keep a client than to get a new one. And luxury is a little bit different. You know how they say the early bird gets the worm? Sometimes the second mouse gets the cheese. Why is that? They listed with an agent that told them they could get whatever they wanted for that house. They maybe dropped the ball. They, you know, they weren't being attentive. They weren't being a good listener. And guess what? That mouse got trapped. So here comes you. There's your opportunity to go take that cheese right? Because someone already told them everything they wanted. To. Now that there's a fine line that keep in mind, we're going to go, we're going to dive a little deep into what does the luxury client want, need, how is it different from an average sales price? So we'll get into that. Um, I'll have to look up the website uh, that I use for the moving boxes and I'll, uh, I'll post that later. Uh, gift ideas and how do I manage the logistics of getting it out? Um, transaction right? You have to know, you have, I have a great TC and she sends reminders. So it literally goes in my calendar, go get this for them, go have this delivered to them. And that's part of what we do. Um, so I have my TC that calendars it for me and some gift ideas. Um, it depends on what they like, right? I go back to my questionnaire. Do they like champagne? Do they not drink? Do they um, it just depends, but something, a few things that I do for all the clients, as I mentioned, is the moving boxes. Um, I also do candles, which I do take note when I'm going through a house. If there's no candles or no scented anything, I ask them, would, would you mind if a candle got lit or if there was a room spray put on, uh, put in the house? Because I want to make sure no one has allergies. And also something is I go and show every luxury listing. If you take a luxury listing, you don't want the sellers there, right? So who else knows the house just as good as the sellers? You do. So why wouldn't you be showing that house? That buyer's agent and those buyers are going through the house for the first time. They're just looking at it like, oh, that's nice. Are you going to tell them the upgrades and the price of things that that seller put into the home? The seller gave you all the history of it. And now you should do um, a duty to your clients and share that with them. Um, other get, okay, so candles, you know, something that I share often is I drop that off after the listing agreement and I say, I hope this, uh, I hope to have your home sold before the wick runs out on this candle and everything has my logo on it. Everything has my logo on it. Uh, make sure that you're always branding. Let's see. And logistics of getting out. Yeah. So sometimes um, I have a runner, I have a teenage driver now, so yay labor. Um, and so uh, it just depends on, you know, where they're at. Uh, sometimes clients are not local. And so logistics can vary. Be flexible. That's the big thing too, is be flexible and be willing to adapt. You need to make them feel important, no matter where they're at. Even if it's the hardest transaction or the easiest transaction you've had, you want them to make sure that if anyone around them or anyone that they knew was going to be buying or selling, they would never allow them to use anyone but you, okay? Um, who are the luxury clients, right? Who are they? Where are they? How do I find them? Uh, something I like to say is don't be like Liam Neeson. You know that movie Taken? He's like, I will find you. Don't be a stalker. Don't be a creeper. They exist. They're everywhere. But we're going to go over where do you find them? Uh, where are they? And who are they? So where do you think they are? Are you aware of your surroundings? First of all, you should always be aware of your surroundings. Have you ever noticed you're at a restaurant and you hear someone say, like, sell my house or real estate, and all of a sudden your ears perk up and you're like, wait, I'm, I'm, I know those words. They just, you're in a busy restaurant, but it's like you, that person sitting next to you. Okay. Always be mindful of your surroundings. Where are you? Who are you with? And an important question that I like to tell everyone is, I ask everyone this, who do you know that I should know? I was once, once coaching an agent 
And she was like, Natasha, my friends are broke. Like I can't even get them in, I can't get them pre-approved. She was like, and my family is broker. She said, I don't know anybody with money. So how am I supposed, and I said, you know somebody, you're just not reaching out. Okay, so your friends maybe don't have the money, but they know somebody. She's like, nope, they don't. I said, where do they work? Who do they work for? Are they connecting you with that person? Is that the owner of the company? So make sure that you're asking your friends, uh, make sure you're asking your clients, who do you know that I should know? You might be surprised at who they introduced you to that you would have never guessed they were connected to. Um, I, I'm in Houston, so we have sports teams. We've got the Rockets, we've got the Dynamo, we've got the Texans, and we've got the Astros. And my first, um, my first uh, client with the Astros, guess where he came from? Somebody that I was paying and seeing every single week, my son's baseball hitting coach. His, his friend from college um, is a sports agent and he got someone that was gonna be pitching for the Astros. Hey, he really wants someone that'll take good care of someone. And I gave him your name and number just because I know you really well. And I know you can handle, you can handle them. They're probably kind of needy. So I gave them your information. My son had been doing hitting practice with this coach for over a year. I would see him every Tuesday and Thursday. And I got an MLB player referred to by him. So who do you know that I should know? Make sure everyone knows who you are, what you do. Um, luxury customizations, yes. Customize everything. Everything should have your logo on it. There's my logo, everything. I, Cut cone eyes, I get cut cone eyes with my logo. I order 1942 Don Julio tequila. Guess what? I have my logo etched in it. Those make for great gifts, but know your audience. Know your audience, make sure they like tequila. Um, so know your surroundings, who you're around, who do you know that I should know? And then who do you give your business to? Who are you always giving your business to? And, you know, even if it's, like Eli said earlier, Chick-fil-A, you're going through a Chick-fil-A window and you're going pretty often and you know that guy, how are you today? Ask them how they're doing. We don't do that enough. Wouldn't you agree? We're so busy just going through the motions and doing what we're supposed to do. We forget to ask other people, how are you? And um, here in Texas, it's pretty common. Like every strangers talk to you all the time. So if you're ever visiting Texas, it's very normal for people that you don't know to smile at you and ask you how you're doing. Ask them how they're doing. Ask them how their day is going. You never know who you're talking to and you never know who they know, okay? Um, social media. Social media is huge and it's in so many different aspects. Uh, you know, there's meetup.com. When you think of when you think of social media, you're like, oh, Facebook, Instagram, there's meetup.com. What hobbies do you have? Are you engaging with people when you're doing those hobbies? If working out is your hobby, if playing tennis is your hobby, if, you know, um, I created a corgi club. I have corgi dogs, you know, those little dogs that have, well, they're kind of bigger dogs, but they have short little legs. Corgi people are crazy, y'all. Not even joking. There are so many corgi groups that I joined and my last closing for 2022 and my first closing for 2023 was because they needed a yard for their corgi. So make sure that you're interacting in social media. Follow the groups that you want to be a part of. Okay, don't go into groups and just pour all over the place that you're in real estate and start posting all your listings. Find people that like what you like. Find people that do what you do. And eventually they'll know who you are and what you do. Make sure that they do. Um, but social media is huge. And then that goes into, do you know what your feeder markets are? Okay, and I'm gonna get to that because you need to know how to send out social media to those feeder markets. 
say for, for Texas, Colorado is pretty big, California is pretty big, Louisiana is pretty big. Um, those are our feeder markets. I'm making sure that I am engaging on social media to those um, specific areas. And if you need help finding out specifically what those counties are, what those cities are, what those zip codes are, um, title companies can usually help you with that. But I am making sure that I am sending ads to those specific areas. I'm connecting with people in those specific areas. Why is that important? Not everyone in your local market is going to stay in your local market. You've got to find people that are coming from other places. So social media, also good for referral partners. Are you connecting with agents in those other markets? Are you reaching out to agents that service your feeder markets that you can let them know send them updates see send them updates on the houston market or whatever market you're in send them market updates ask them to do the same for you if they're already doing it great you're going to get that and now you get to share that um, are you asking them how business is going there make sure that you are connecting with referral agents for your feeder markets and something that's so important, particularly around luxury, is knowing your value proposition. Why should they go with you? What is it that makes you an agent that is, and if you think they can't smell commission breath, we all know those agents. We all know those agents, right? We know those agents that come in and they just want to get the sale and they know it too. Now, when you're dealing with luxury clients, Chances are they don't get told no a lot. They're typically going to be owners or uh, people that are being are used to being the ones telling other people what to do and how to do it. Know know your audience and um, make sure that you tell them your value proposition. They know realtors can sell a house. How are you going to stand out? How are you going to be different? That's beneficial to them to work with you. If you don't have that written and as part of your uh, as part of your listing package or your buyer's rep consultation package, I strongly suggest you do that. So how is a luxury sale different than an average sale? If anyone has worked with a luxury sale, can you raise your hand? Anything we'll just say because I know our markets are different. So I'm going to say over a million dollars. Was it easy breezy? Was it just, oh, I'm going to put a sign in the yard and it's, it's going to just get sold? On the contrary, ours didn't even allow a sign in the yard. There you go. So they have expectations. Make sure that you know their expectations and make sure that you set expectations as well, particularly around if they are wanting a higher price point. Okay, so a lot of times they get told, how do you bridge that gap? What do you do? Because I went for that listing and they were here. I get an appraisal. If I'm getting a listing agreement signed when it comes to luxury, I'm getting an appraisal at the beginning so that we have that and that helps bridge the gap, right? Mr. Seller, the appraiser supersedes my opinion anyway. Let's go ahead and get an appraisal because they're going to do a few things. They're going to tell us where we're at and they're gonna measure it out. We're gonna make sure we get exact square footage. We can have that in the back pocket too for negotiations. So you have that. So how you show up matters as well, you guys, when it comes to luxury versus average um, price point homes. How you show up matters. It starts with you. And um, we have gone back and forth in a debate, I think particularly Eli and I, on, you know, you're going to a listing appointment, make sure your car is washed, make sure you're dressed nice, make sure that you, you know, you've been ready for this, you let them know that they were the most important appointment that you had that day. Um, so how you show up matters and do your research, do your research on these people, we have social media available to us. How, how do you, now is the time to like go back to that Liam Neeson character. Now you go stalk them, find them on Facebook, find them on Instagram, find them on Twitter, find out what they like, find out, you know, who do they work for? Do you have any friends in common? Um, you know, you, you can find out so much on social media. Again, know your audience. 
but do your research on that. As of course, it's a given. You're going to do research on the home. You should know the property. You should know what you're what you're going to be um, listing or trying to list. But know them as well. Do your research on them, and then they're going to have higher expectations. I would love to tell you that you're going to go to a listing appointment and they're going to just think you're great. They're going to challenge you. Be prepared. Do some role playing with a friend or your partner. Um, find out where your gaps are before you go on the appointment. Okay, but they're going to challenge you. They have 10 other agents lined up wanting to sell a luxury home. Everybody wants to sell luxury, right? Now, something that a lot of people don't talk about, and I can't tell you how many agents have come to me after the fact, not realizing because they didn't do the research themselves. Maybe you've never sold luxury before. Let me tell you, it is expensive. You should be spending money on your luxury listings. Uh, you know, Matterport, typically the homes are pretty large. You're going to want to do Matterport so you can do a walkthrough. Keep in mind, not everyone is local. You might have a buyer looking at it from a different state. You're going to want them to be able to go through the home. You're going to want to be able to shoot out that listing to your feeder markets, and they need to be able to walk through it. Are you doing a video? We have waterfront here, so I do a lot of drone. Um, I get drone videos as well of the properties. And um, make sure that the pictures are good, you guys you're probably not going to use your typical photographer on a luxury listing that you would um, normally. You're going to want to spend some money. So what does that look like? I never take a luxury listing and spend less than $2,000. That is photography. That is video. That is marketing. I am making sure that I'm servicing that listing at a high level. And going back to I am showing that listing for every appointment. I am accompanying that listing. Now, what if you're out of town? You should always have at least two people that you have toured that are either in your downline or your upline or on your team and utilize them and ask them if they want to go tour it. And then I pay a hefty fee for them to show for me if I'm ever out of town. But I have them walk through the property with me. I'm telling them all the things that I say, making sure that they say them as well. Something that I do that's a little different as well that has served me very well is I tell the seller, by the way, when I show, can I please have a little portion of your fridge? Why do you say? I keep water bottles and I keep mini champagne bottles and I bring glasses. So when I am touring that buyer and their agent, I am giving them champagne and they're going to get to tour this home. I make sure the music sounds great right throughout the home and I'm touring them while they're sipping their champagne. I am setting an experience for them. I've had many buyers and even buyers agents tell me that they've not had that before. So guess what happens? Those buyers, maybe it didn't work out with that buyer's agent. I've picked up quite a few buyers that say, you know what? We remember you from that showing. Because again, knowing your research, when I set the appointment, I asked the buyer's agent, how many other homes are you going to be looking at? Are there going to be any children with them? Guess what? If they're bringing children and I know that I'm like the fourth house, I'm going to bring snacks and I'm going to tell those kiddos, do y'all, do y'all want some snacks? Or you, you've been looking at a lot of houses. Do you want, that goes a long way. They are remembering that I took the time, it's little things, you guys. You think it's expensive to get a few bags of snacks or for water bottles or little champagne bottles? It's not expensive, but I am becoming memorable to them because no one else is doing that. And that buyer's agent, going back to attracting, do you know how many buyer's agents I have assisted or they're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you brought snacks for my client's kids. Thank you so much because that makes them look good. And I always, always, always pay a compliment to that buyer's agent when they're there with their clients. This goes a long way. So little things that are not expensive, that make a big difference, that create an ex a memorable experience. I'm going to challenge all of you to think about things that you can do that you can um, make yourself memorable. These are just some of the things I do. Take it, run with it, do your thing.
But again, going back to the cost, it is expensive to take um, a listing. Sometimes there are agents that have asked me to co-list because maybe they can't afford it. So maybe someone else went for a listing and I never interviewed for it. Um, or I did, and they asked me to co-list because either they can't afford it or they bump heads with the seller. Maybe they already, I've had this happen before too, where someone did take um, a higher price point listing and they just were like, I can't deal with this seller, but I think you're great. And I think you should take this listing. Great. I'll pay you a referral fee. So, so know that there are other, who are those other agents? Know that there are other agents that may want to do this and they don't know how. And you can be there. You can be there to help them and they can be there to help you. So if you're not that agent that can help others, who are the agents that you would go to? Okay. Don't be afraid to refer the client out. Okay. It's if you cannot service them or you're, bu you're bumping heads with that seller or you can't afford to pay for the photography or you just please consider referring out and make that person, you know, someone in your upline or downline, um, make them your partner, make them your partner for that listing, make them your partner in luxury and brokers open. Opens. I highly recommend you do them. Um, why are they so important? Personally, I go over different things with uh, my sellers as to why I don't like to hold public open houses on luxury homes. I don't want people scoping out their things. I don't want people that are not qualified to come through there. And I do my due diligence as a listing agent before I am taking my time and making my seller clean up their home, leave their home. I'm making sure that I have a pre-approval that I've called the lender and verified or that I have um, proof of funds. And again, I've called the banker. I've called their financial advisor. I've called whoever's on that paper and I can make sure that they are qualified. I'm not going to waste my seller's time. And then they appreciate that. Something else you can do. Again, this is going, what, what are you doing that's extra, right? Um, when those love letters came out, or I shouldn't say came out when they were really popular. Do y'all remember multiple offers? Remember that market? And sellers were getting these letters of, oh, my family would absolutely love this house. It's everything they've ever dreamed of. And they send the picture with the kids and the dogs. And the... I told my sellers, hey, just FYI, we might get multiple offers. We might get some love letters. We might get some photos. There is already a case. There's already a legal case where a family felt like they were discriminated against. Do you, is this something you want to do? No, I don't want to risk that. If there's multiple people and I have to pick one, I'm going to pick whoever has looks the most qualified, right, correct. And I'm going to assist you in making doing my due diligence. However, there's already a lawsuit out there. So we will put in our listing agreements that the seller does not want to be uh, presented with any love letters or photos or personal items um, sent over with the contract. That is me looking out for the client that's knowing what's happening. If you're not always paying attention to your local association, your state association, the national association, and cases that they have working in rules and laws, um, you really, really should. It's important that you know that information so that you can represent your clients best. So let's see here. Uh, let's see, Veronica, oh, sign up. Are you paying the appraisal? So I will pay for the appraisal if we have a signed listing agreement. I'm not paying for um, photos or an appraisal if I don't have a signed agreement with that client. Um, if I have a signed agreement with that client, I'm looking at it as it's part of, of me representing them. Uh, brokers opens with mimosas. Yes, actually. So for my brokers opens, I do... Um, mimosas and food truck. And I make sure we have a really good giveaway. So I had a client um, a while back and he owns hotels. So it was like weekend getaways to two different places. I normally ask the client to participate and assist with the, uh, with the giveaway for brokers open. You want realtors to come? Have alcohol. 
and have a good prize and they will be there. Um, I am selective about who I invite to brokers opens. Again, y'all going back to doing your research. You want to invite agents that have those clients. Okay, you want to, you, you can't have, I mean, you can, but um, there's a lot of agents in my association. <laughs> I'm in Houston. I don't want 53,000 agents coming in. No, um, but I want to make sure that I'm inviting agents that have sold around the community and that have other uh, luxury clients. And also when, when you're doing this, I, I really, really, this is what I'm passionate about. Find an agent that you know has great potential. Take them under your wing. Show them what you know. If you know that they have... Um, great motivation, great potential. Take them and tour your luxury listing. Show them how you tour it. Invite them to the brokers open. Um, huge, huge thing for, for uh, your downline. So how can you work now to prepare to create an experience? And again, if you want to mute yourself, we can go back and forth, but I'm going to tell you guys, I am constantly looking at how I can sharpen my tools in my bag. Okay. And when I'm showing, I literally have a showing kit. I should have had it here with me, but I literally have a showing kit that opens up and I have dog treats in there. Cause you never know when the seller leaves their dog out or their dog breaks out of their cage. I had that happen one time. Y'all, I felt like Cujo was coming for me. I had dog treats. I have hand wipes in there, uh, post-it notes in case you need to little, leave a little note for the seller. Uh, you know, this was unlocked when I got here, left it unlocked. Um, hand sanitizer, um, measuring tape, um, a flashlight. I have all that because if my client, if I'm showing my client and they're like, oh, I don't know if my furniture is going to fit here. Do you happen to know the dimensions of that? You do? Great. Look, I've got a measuring tape. Let's measure it out and see if it'll fit. Be a solution-based person. I heard something recently. I think it was an open book and it said, um, when solutions meet problems, money exchanges hands. Yes, very, very true. Have solutions, have, um, have different ideas for their objections. Again, know your value proposition, strengthen, uh, work, continue working on your strengths, work on your weaknesses. There's a book, going back to the Disney cruise, there's a book called Be Our Guests, and it's all about the Disney experience. It is a book I highly recommend, um, but it's called Be Our Guests. And yeah, there's something else that we have available. Uh, it's available, to, he's available to everyone really, but if you all don't know, Michael Lafito, he teaches the luxury designation course and it's uh, luxurydesignation.com. And it is a recognized designation. He's got some great tools. He, he has a great book. I've read it, it's fantastic. Um, he's got a digital brochure that you also get, and he does coaching videos. Now I met him a few years back when I was at Keller Williams and he was like, you need to do a community video. You need to do a community video. So I made a community video and it talks about all the great things I love about Houston. It shows the sports facilities. It shows the water and some boats out on the water, some restaurants, because we have amazing food here. So I would tell you, do a great community video. Send that out to your feeder markets. And then also, um, this is pricey, but if you can, take the Ritz-Carlton Gold Standard Leadership class. That is going to be a great resource for you. And it'll also change how you go into places and you're expecting that experience. We oftentimes forget that we are who we are, you know, we are, we're going to get an experience too. We might, we're, don't be so focused on giving the experience. Make sure you do go to Ritz Carlton sometime if you can and see what kind of experience you get. When problems are solved, money exchanges hands. Yes, that is, that's, I love that great takeaway. Okay, the listing goes beyond 30 days on the market. Do you change or add something to the experience? Okay, so again, that's going back to expectations and what expectations you set. I don't know what the average days on the market is where you're at. Obviously, your goal is always to beat that, to beat the average days on the market, but it's just setting clear expectations. I put something in my listing agreements where 
if the um, if we're not getting any bites and we are going to be reducing the price every three weeks. Every three weeks, we're going to be reducing the price and we have, you know, we do have a bond number. Um, and so it's just setting those expectations. But do I add something or do something to the experience? Well, it depends. Um, where are they? Again, it's knowing your audience. You know, if they're super stressed, I might send her to the spa. Um, I might, you know, send him a bottle of whiskey, just depending on what they like. Again, going back to my questionnaire, because I know I already know them. Um, and if they're on vacation all the time, I will, you know, tell them I drove by the house to check on it. Again, you guys, you're not just taking a listing. And I know some people may not see it this way, but for me, I let them know I am their go-to everything when I'm working with them. I'm not just there to get their house sold. If they're out of town and they're going to be gone for a few weeks and maybe I didn't have a showing that week, I'm still going to go buy the house, make sure everything's okay. And I just, I, it, I just, I take, um, personally, I take a lot of pride in my listings and I want to make sure that I am going above and beyond. It's my listing. I need to make sure it's showing well. If we get a really bad storm here, which happens pretty often this time of year. I'm going to go make sure my sign is upright. And you guys, if someone else's is falling over, guess what? Go straighten that agent's sign, send them a picture, tell them their sign was messed up and, you know, just do good with other agents. You never know. Um, you never know who that agent is. And let's see. Veronica, connect on Instagram. Also take advantage of the EXP luxury certification. Yes, definitely do that and get plugged in. One of the things I want to say is if you're ever taking um, a luxury listing for your first time, reach out to someone um, in your upline that has done that has already done it and pick their brain a little bit. Veronica just listed my Instagram. Um, find me on Facebook, find me on Instagram message me on messenger. I would love to help you. I'm, I'm here to help anyone I can help. There's enough real estate for all of us. And uh, something that's really important to me is just encouraging agents. I know that everyone wants to sell luxury and I want you to be prepared and well-equipped for when you do get that luxury listing or that luxury buyer on how you show up and how you provide an experience. I promise you, if you do it right, you won't have to make calls. And I know that's right. Like I, I'm sure some people's brains are going, what? Not make calls. When you provide the experience and you do it right, they will make sure nobody would ever use, they would never let them use anybody else but you. They will always make sure that you're the agent that their family and their friends use. And then something else, I'm going to end with this and then go into questions. Client events. I do huge client events. Client events are so important because it gives you the opportunity to say thank you. Now, I don't put all my clients in one. I have something for client for, you know, this client, I have something for that client, and I have something for my for my luxury clients. It's knowing your audience. And here, um, we're also near a military base, so I do a lot of um, military as well. And I do different events. So something I did recent, uh, well, I shouldn't say recently, it was a year ago. I just talked about it recently, though, because the one-year anniversary came up, is um, I rented out the theater for Top Gun. I invited all of my um, military clients, whether they were active or, or uh, they're veterans, I invited them gave them a gift, treated them to the nice theater that we've got here. And do you think that they felt a little bit special? They got a private screening of Top Gun. They had their drink provided, they had their food provided, and they got a gift. Um, and we all recognize them, by the way. I asked each person to step forward and tell me what branch they served in, how, how long. And we had, you know, a 70-year-old man, and we had the chief, current chief officer here, Face. It was a really cool thing. Okay, so what else do I do? Um, knowing your audience, and I would just say for me, the theater is my is my favorite event. 
but I do also do, um, you know, there's top golf locally. Um, we'll do some appetizers and drinks somewhere. And I'm going to be hosting um, probably my first ever, I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to do a luau for my clients. So um, always looking at doing different things. Those are fun events. And, and I do a 4th of July thing. Actually, I shouldn't say 4th of July. I, I call it, a, it's a July 3rd event. July 3rd, I invite my clients to come over. I give them um, a watermelon and some Malibu rum and like a recipe to make a really good infused watermelon. I also give their kiddos little buckets with sparklers and things to get them ready for the 4th of July. So it's my July 3rd event and I get their picture. So I great 4th of July background, have, a, have their picture taken. And then on July 4th, I post them. So that morning I'm posting it. Then guess what they're doing? They're sharing my post of their pictures on 4th of July because they already have their picture. They just did it the day before and they already have their sparklers and all the things that they got from me to get ready for 4th of July so that they can go do 4th of July with whoever they want to do it with. Uh, let's see, anything else? Does anyone have any questions? Uh, Sorry, I'm we... as fast as I can to get it all out. Yeah, before we wrap up, um, first of all, I mean, this is invaluable information, regardless of whether you're working luxury clients or any client. This is just great client relationships, great customer service, great business. Um, so it's, it's absolutely amazing that, uh, you know, no matter the level of clientele, these are really basics of building a community, basics of building a great raving fan community. And luxury clients are real people. Um, so no matter where you're at here in your business, it is important to implement these strategies. I mean, grab one and implement it immediately. Take action, then grab another one and knock it out because that's, what's, that's how you're gonna build these things. Obviously, Natasha has been around for a while. She's been building the systems, building these uh, consistent um, events and, 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 and getting better and better and better. Uh, but there's no better day to take action than now. And remember that with uh, GAP, it's all about taking action, right? It's, it's all about uh, making sure you're not here just hearing this information, but actually implementing it. And I know a lot of you guys are gonna wanna watch this replay. As a reminder, all these replays can be found for all of our events in the globalalliance.university.com. I saw Jenny post a link there in the chat. Now there's another simple thing you gotta do. If you register, it will require you to enter a group code and that uh, you will get from your sponsor, you will get from you know, somebody in your EXP organization that already has access and can provide you that information. Like Natasha said, Natasha has done an amazing job of plugging in with her upline, with her leaders. And uh, you can do the same. You know, Make sure you get to know all of us. Make sure you communicate. Make sure we know you. And, and we can provide you with uh, help with these resources and we can provide you with uh, any assistance that you need. Um, so I just wanted to say that real quick and uh, make sure everybody goes to the Global Alliance University for those replays. Uh, Natasha, take it away. Thank you so much for being here, by the way. You've been absolutely incredible as always. And we're blessed to have you as part of our organization. I'm blessed to have you here uh, delivering massive value to um, the community. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. Um, the 4th of, or the 3rd of July background, I have pictures, um, reach out to me on social media or, or send me a text. Let me put my phone number in here, um, but find me on Facebook and I'll, I can tag you in it because I have the whole event, um, on my social. So I can tag you guys in that. It's a huge hit it's, and I, I do have it at my house. So I have it because it, it's, to me, it's more personal. Um, and again, I do different events for different clients. Okay. We've all had those crazy clients that there's no way we'd have them come to our house. That's not who I'm inviting to my house. Um, let's see who pays for the appraisal for your listings. I pay for the appraisal because I, if I have that signed listing agreement, then I am paying for that. Cause I'm considering that cost of doing business. If the client cancels, however, 
um, I do have it in my contract that I will be reimbursed for any expenses incurred. So uh, I don't know what state you're in and what that looks like. Okay, so you just said LA. Uh, what's the cost? So it just depends on the square footage. So an appraisal for maybe a 6,000 square foot house here is gonna be about $2,000. It's super important though, because I want to have that in the back of in my back pocket um, if needed for negotiations. And as we all know, if it's not favorable, right? If I'm like, oh, this one just is not, but be proactive. If you have the listing um, and the buyer is getting an appraisal, be proactive. Let, uh, let that appraiser know what comps you use. Make sure you're connected with that appraiser before they send out their report. Here locally, our appraisers love it when we tell them, I just wanted to let you know this is where my market analysis is and here's what I came up with and ha that's how I came up with it. Um, they love it. So I will make sure that I get their email or their phone number um, if, that, if they're calling me from a landline or their office. I make sure I get that so I can send that report to them right when they're looking at my listing, not after, because I don't want them working on their report without seeing where I, and that's just being proactive. Um, and also setting expectations with your sellers, knowing that at the end of the day, an appraisal is an opinion of value. We can have four different appraisals and four different values. So just being proactive. Appraisers rely on our market expertise. It's our job to help them. Absolutely. Appraisers love when we are assisting them with all the information. And again, just like you would a buyer, make sure that I have the sellers write out for me, um, or they can just tell me and I'm writing it out, all the things that they've done, all the upgrades, because that's important not only for the buyers, it's really important for the appraisers to have that. So make sure that you are being proactive with getting that value up as well. All right. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. If anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to me. You can find me on social media or there's my phone number. And um, I would love to hear from you guys.